Hello, everyone, and welcome to 15 Minutes of Frame, our cross-continental conversation series that brings together the staff of the National Portrait Galleries from around the world. Um, we're going to go behind the scenes, get to, to know what makes them tick, and we have a fantastic lineup today um, of panellists from Scotland, New Zealand and Australia and a terrific topic. So we're going to kick off with our conversation shortly. Uh, this evening, I am broadcasting from the beautiful countries of the Nambri and the Ngunnawal peoples, and I'd like to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend that same respect to any of the lands on which you're coming to us from today. My name is Jill Raymond, and I'm going to be the host of the conversation today. We like to make all of our virtual programs here at the National Portrait Gallery in Australia extremely interactive. So if you would like to ask a question of our panellists this evening, please pop it into the chat or the Q&A function in Zoom or into the chat function on if you're joining us live on Facebook. All right, let's meet our panellists. Um, joining us bright and early from Edinburgh is Christopher Baker. He is the Director of the European and Scottish Art and Portraiture at the National Gallery of Scotland. Paul Johnson is a curator at Te Pukenga Bakaata, New Zealand's National Portrait Gallery, and I do apologise if I've mangled that pronunciation. And Joanna Gilmore is our very own uh, Curator of Collection and Research here at the National Portrait Gallery in Canberra, Australia. Now, the topic that we've selected uh, for their conversation today is a meaty one. We've chosen power and portraiture and what a can of worms we're about to open this evening and this morning if you're coming from to us from overseas there's so much to unpick in this topic um, not least of all is the fact that portrait galleries themselves are very much embedded in and came from we're born from particular power structures so let me throw over to joe and she'll uh, kick off the conversation there we are <laughs> Can you guys both hear me? That's good. Yeah. Great. <laughs> well, um, hello to you both. Uh, good morning to you, Paul. <laughs> Sorry, good evening to you, Paul, and good morning to you, Christopher. You really drew uh, the, short, the short straw in having to get up at a quarter past six in the morning in Edinburgh to, <laughs> to tune in to join us for this conversation. It's lovely uh, to be but... with you, no problem. <laughs> Great, and we're really sort of looking forward to having this conversation. Although, as Jill has sort of warned us, I think it, you know, it could be potentially a bit of a can of worms. But what I thought uh, we'd do this evening is sort of based on that kind of warm-up conversation that we had a few weeks ago, I've kind of pulled out a few sort of meaty themes that I thought we could uh, get started with, uh, if you like, and then we can sort of take it in whatever direction it, it chooses to go in. Um, and the other thing that Jill mentioned in her intro is that sort of an, a thing that sort of I think came through very strongly from our conversation a few weeks ago was that idea of, um, you know, colonial legacies. And it's always been of interest to me that there are very, very few national portrait galleries in the world and the bulk of them that exist are in places that are English-speaking countries and also places that have uh, a British colonial history. So Australia, New Zealand, the United States being the two that I'm thinking of in, in that sort of context. And that's always really intrigued me. And I was wondering if, if you wanted to sort of, if you wanted to say something about your feelings about that sort of, that characteristic of portrait galleries, what is it about sort of British colonial origins that makes us want to <laughs> sort of stake our claim in this way and discover our identity and record our identity in this way. I'll throw that to you, Paul, first, if you like. Sure. Um, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about the New Zealand Portrait Gallery is that unlike um, the two galleries where you two are coming from, um, we are very much a kind of private nonprofit initiative um, that was kind of founded by just um, one woman who decided that um, New Zealand ought to have a portrait gallery. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, I think that probably says something about um, kind of uh, New Zealand being this country that is, has this very, um, or at least used to have a very um, British centered um, 
sense of national identity. Um, and I think this is where, you know, even even conceiving or conceiving of the idea that this is um, an institution a country ought to have um, by a private individual speaks to her um, uh, existing in this um, in this kind of Anglo-centric British world, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Um, I know your gallery is, has a very different history, Christopher, um, which maybe you could. <laughs> uh, absolutely. So I think it's a really interesting point that you raise about um, the fact that National Portrait Galleries um, are confined in many ways to the English speaking world. And I think um, it's partly because of their history and the way in which they, they, they grew up in the 19th century, a very different mm -hmm. world from the one we have now. And um, there were strong motivations then, which perhaps we're very uncomfortable with now, but we need mm -hmm. to recognize that that was the context to do with um, nationhood, to do with um, education, and actually in, in the Scottish context, there's a, a remarkable man called Carlyle, who you're probably familiar with, great historian in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. he, he had a very simple but incredibly powerful idea as he saw it. If you wanted to understand history, you needed to see the faces of the people who'd made history, mm -hmm. which is a very, very powerful motivation. And I think um, it does connect with colonialism, just as you rightly, rightly imply, but a lot of other forces that came to bear in the 19th century. Um, I have to say happily, of course, and rightly, we've moved way beyond that. So mm. the Portrait Gallery is obviously now are something quite different, inclusive, open, uh, not hierarchical at all. Um, and that's as, as it should be. But that, that history is interesting and, it, and, and indeed important to, to, to be aware of. Yes, and always intrigued me, I think, is that, you know, Thomas Carlyle, of course, is one of the sort of driving forces behind the foundation of the Portrait Gallery in London in 1856. And, you know, I affectionately referred to MPG London as the mothership, <laughs> and I still do. And Absolutely. even while acknowledging all of that very problematic history and those sort of uncomfortable elements of our origins, it's always really interesting to me how much of Carlyle's sort of original concept about learning about history through um, or learning history as refracted through individual lives and representations of, of individuals and learning through biography is how that still very much resonates with me working here um, a long time <laughs> after uh, Carlyle was uh, promoting his ideas and the, the sort of concepts behind the foundation of NPG London in the 1850s. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, oh, the, the other strand of this, of course, though, is that um, uh, portrait galleries thrive in an environment where the art of portraiture in all its different forms is, is lively and there's, there's um, uh, a sort of many artists who are excited about, about, about that challenge as well. So there is the, the, the political dimension, but very importantly, the, the artistic dimension too, to, to all of this, I think, which is um, fascinating. Mm. And I think some would argue too that, well, certainly I'm speaking here about the Australian context, that sort of idea. Actually, could we have a look at one of my slides, Robert, which is, um, it's just a, a quote. So it's the, the only one of my slides that hasn't got any images on it. I'm not sure whether um, Christopher and Paul are familiar with this, <laughs> this quote, but it's the British painter, Benjamin Robert Hayden. And it's a a quote that I often come back to in sort of thinking about, um, well, it's about Australian portraiture in specifically, I guess, because I think one of the uh, one of the perceptions of uh, of portraiture is that, and this is something that I kind of grapple with all the time, is that it's it's not real art. You know, it's just something that uh, a lot of artists did, and this is certainly uh, the case in the Australian colonial context. It's a lot of um, stuff that was made simply because artists were out here and portraiture was a, a way you could make a living. Uh, 19th century Australia, particularly um, up until, you know, pretty much up until Federation, it was very much uh, a, a sort of middle class uh, kind of provincial society, a very sort of opportunistic society. A lot of people who were out here, A, because <laughs> either because they didn't have any choice about being out here or who came out here because they saw it as a, a place of opportunity. Uh, aspirational sort of clientele, I suppose. So it was very, uh, was ripe, ripe territory for, for portrait painters. 
Uh, and I think I'll just I'll sort of bring this in here as, as well, um, is that other sort of a very much a closely related factor and another thing that sort of came out of our conversation uh, that, that we had a few weeks ago to, to, get, this, uh, to get this program happening was um, once again, I think a, a, a point that you made, Christopher, about the implications of, of portrait collecting and specifically the assumption that um, by collecting and displaying portraits, National portrait galleries are supposedly shaping or perpetuating concepts of who is powerful and important and worthy of respect, uh, and also uh, shaping concepts of what type of portraits, what type of object are most worthy or most appropriate in that context. Um, and I know, Paul, you've just, if it hasn't finished already, you've worked on an exhibition which is just about to finish, which is on that very sort of question, that notion of um, portraits as power, as a form of perpetuating and disseminating ideas about power and influence. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that exhibition and maybe about some of the works that you featured in it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and um, if anyone here is in Wellington, uh, it will be open until this Sunday. So you still have a few days left, um, but not very many. Um, and maybe we could start with um, this image of a single coin um, from my slides, um, because I think this is something I, I think is quite important um, as context. Um, yeah, so um, this, is, <clears throat> uh, this is sort of arguably the uh, very first um, kind of realistic portrait, portrait in the Western tradition. Um, and it's a portrait of Alexander the Great. Um, and like a big part of the reason that everyone knows who Alexander the Great is even today is um, precisely because he was this first person who cottoned onto this idea that he could um, kind of uh, commission people to make reproductions of his face um, that actually looked like him. Um, and distributed them widely across the world. Um, so this coin wasn't even made by Alexander the Great. It was made by one of his successor kings who took over his kingdom, his empire after he died. Um, and this guy Lysim Lysimachus um, is still making coins with Alexander's face on them because this is a way to lay claim to his legacy. Um, and so I think thinking about currency in particular is a really interesting kind of way into um, mm -hmm. the kind of ways that uh, portraiture kind of very kind of in a very material way manifests power. Um, this is how you know your money is legitimate, even to this day, um, mm. is that it has a picture um, in all the places that we live in, a picture of the queen. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, Absolutely, it's, it's the power of it's it's the power of um, I suppose reproduction makes a portrait more powerful, doesn't it? Duplication and mm -hmm. and um, uh, it's so it's so interesting seeing um, coinage. We I think we tend to forget it wrongly forget about coinage and medals and mm -hmm. um, when we're thinking about portraiture, but they're fundamental and global as well, actually. Um, and uh, I'm struck by the fact that at the moment most of us are not using much physical money. Um, so. <laughs> Actually, actually, for, for obvious reasons. So, so that that power has actually diminished a bit right right now. Um, mm. it, is, it is it is so interesting, and um, it's it's to, it's to do with. Um, so, this is a very simple way of putting it, but in some ways, endorsement. I think actually, endorsement of power. So, just as um, you know, if a portrait enters enters a national portrait gallery, to a degree, that is some level of endorsement. But also having. Uh, the head of an uh, incredibly important head of state, let's put it like that, on a coin or a medal or a banknote, it's 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 solidifying and 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 duplicating mm. that power, isn't it? Really. Mm. Mm. And you had some observations about Robert Burns in relation oh, yes. to that question of the reproduction of and dissemination of of images. That's right. Could could we? Um, thank you. Could we kind of look at the um, the image of Burns that's in the a portrait gallery in Edinburgh, which is by um, an artist called Alexander Naismith. Thank you. There it is. That, that's great. So this is um, a late 18th century portrait um, from the life. Um, this is Robert Burns, the 
national poet, the great bard of Scotland, actually painted by a friend of his, Alexander Naismith. And from the outset, this was intended to be reproduced and duplicated. It was actually engraved as a print in an early edition of the, the um, poet's poetry. However, it's taken on um, another life, many other lives, because since then it's been reproduced millions of times on souvenirs, on um, all sorts of, in all sorts of media. And this small, modest, although very attractive painting has become uh, an icon way beyond its original um, circumstances of creation through, uh, through reproduction, essentially. And it's become much more powerful than I think could ever have been originally anticipated. That's what I'd suggest through that process. Mm. And Burns is someone, um, I mean, I guess uh, an Australian or equivalent for us in terms of the Portrait Gallery's collection would be someone like Queen Victoria. Actually, we've got an image of Queen Victoria, I think, somewhere. Uh, and, you know, Queen Victoria is someone who never ventured to Australia, <laughs> yet she is, uh, she is inescapable here. There is so much of this country. Yeah, that's a, that wonderful little um, cut de visite from 1860, which is on the left-hand side of the screen. So I guess... Um, this is not that you would know it from this image. She looks like just any old other sort of <laughs> middle-class, respectable <laughs> wife and mother. But at the point that this is taken, she is possibly the most powerful person on the planet with countless uh, hectares <laughs> of territory under her control and millions and millions of people sort of for, for whom she was the, the sovereign. Uh, and what, I mean, I'm, fascinated with cuts to visite from uh, all sorts for all sorts of reasons I've paired her uh, with the lady on the right who was a woman named Marie Sibley who was a, a traveling phrenologist and hypnotist uh, who worked on the gold fields in Victoria and also in New South Wales a little bit uh, in the 1860s and 1870s and I've, I've paired the monarch with this you know rather kind of uh, spurious <laughs> show woman <laughs> just sort of to, to demonstrate uh, the, you know, the kind of scope of the, the portrait galleries collection and that whereas there might be this conception that national portrait galleries only collect images of um, household names and people who were very distinguished or very powerful or very beautiful or very important or very historically significant in some way. Um, what, we're, what we're very much doing in, in building a collection here is not just thinking about the individuals, but thinking about the way those individuals were represented and thinking very much about the way that portraiture was practised and consumed in all of its kind of glory. <laughs> for the, for, so we were creating a history of portraiture, I suppose. Uh, and the wonderful thing about those images of Queen Victoria, like I say, they were, they were taken in 1860 and she made what must have been a really kind of radical decision at the time, which was to make, there's a whole series of those photographs. Uh, the photographer went to Buckingham Palace. He photographed Victoria and Albert and all the kids. And Victoria gave permission for those images to be reproduced en masse and circulated um, everywhere. <laughs> and that's how, that's how the carte de visite took hold definitely in Australia. Those um, photographs were available here, um, if not in 1860, then definitely by 1861, so very shortly after they were taken. And it, it almost, uh, it basically paved the way for the uptake of photography on a massive scale here, not just because the carte de visite was such a, an affordable, accessible format, but because the Queen was demonstrating to all and sundry that she was quite comfortable with circulating her image and popularizing herself in that way yeah extraordinary I, I might oh sorry um no. i wonder if i might bring up um uh maybe we could get the photo of um this portrait of the queen being unveiled um that i've got on yes my i was going to ask you about those i was intrigued <laughs> by those images <laughs> Um, <laughs> and that one, they're all sipping um, simultaneously. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the things that's remarkable, like this is um, the New Zealand Portrait Gallery has a really tiny collection, um, I, you know, something like 200 items. Um, 
And this is one of the most recent items to enter our collection, um, is this painting of the Queen, um, done from life um, by a New Zealand painter who went over to um, London and had a couple of sittings with her and then unveiled in a, um, a as you can see, a very kind of grandiose ceremony. Um, this um, painting you can see on the back wall is actually like a, another painting of the Queen from the uh -huh. 50s, I think, like a really old one. Um, and this is a new one. This is like the new one for the 21st century. Um, and apparently it was commissioned by a group of uh, young New Zealanders who wanted to express their um, support for the Queen. Um, and so um, it's very interesting to sort of see that this is still... Um, I don't know, there's uh, this, this idea of wanting um, a, a new image of the queen um, was something very important to this group of people. Um, and it's the first um, painting of the queen made for New Zealand since mm -hmm. this one in the 50s. Um, and um, it's interesting, it's in a traditional medium as well, because it is oil on canvas, isn't it, actually? So it's sort of, there's a yeah. Fasc yeah. fascinating um, tr uh, sort of appropriateness about that. Yeah, um, but I also wanted to juxtapose it with this other painting of the Queen. Um, can we get at the painting of the Queen with um, a cigarette in her hand, please? Um, because I think something that's um, so interesting about, um, about the kind of dissemination of the image is that um, the person disseminating the image just loses control of it. Um, and the queen can kind of disseminate her image all she likes in these sort of official media, um, but artists are always free to do whatever they want with um, her image. And this painting, um, it's kind of hard to tell from this image, but this is an immaculately painted painting. Um, mm -hmm. te in, in technical terms, it far exceeds that official painting we were just look looking at. Like mm -hmm. the detail on this is um, incredible. Um, and it's a, it's a painting when you first look at it, you think sort of seems like a very reverent um, depiction of the queen. But of course you look closer and you see the cigarette in her hand. Um, and I've talked to Liz Moore who painted this um, now yeah. 20 years ago. Um, and she says she, she wanted to think about the idea of like a kind of secret life um, that there's sort of something about the queen that we can't access from, from her kind of official depictions. Um, and you know, maybe she secretly has a cigarette every now and then. Um, and we just don't know because her image is so curated. Um, and I think this idea of image control is a really interesting one. Um, yeah. Very important, isn't it? It's, to, it's to interesting to see that that juxtaposition um, and the artistic freedom um, that in fact that, that, that represents. But of course the, the freedom comes depending upon what context the, the, the painting or the, the portrait is intended to be shown. And I'd suggest who pays for it as well. That, that seems to me a, a, a key issue here because there's a sort of whole economic dimension behind formal portraiture, uh, you know, mm. a, a agreed endorsed portraiture and um, uh, sort of private and more subversive portraiture that actually begs other, other questions. It's quite, quite a strong distinction between the two. Mm. <laughs> Maybe we should go back to that um, that sort of spectre that was raised by the recent portrait of the Queen, uh, the sort of portrait of, uh, or the question of the the quality, the aesthetic qualities of of the work <laughs> itself, uh, because as I sort of mentioned at the start, I think that's. Uh, you know, that's one of the things certainly that you encounter as a curator of a portrait collection is this, this idea that it's, it's not real art, it's portraits are somehow inferior for, for whatever reason, either that's because they are the sort of images that we see on coins and banknotes or on telly in publicity magazines, those sorts of things. Um, that they only show, uh, you know, a select there. It's a very self, you know, self-selecting genre. They only show a, a certain sort of uh, group of people or category of people. They, of course, also have an uncomfortable association with factors like pride and vanity, et cetera. Um, and fundamentally, I suppose, uh, the other thing that uh, 
uh, you're always encountering, especially with if you're like me and you're dealing or prefer to deal mostly with uh, 19th century or colonial art, um, they're not artworks that necessarily originate out of, or supposedly not artworks that originate out of a, you know, artistic genius or creative inspiration. They're the result of a rather sort of dis dispassionate commercial transaction between an artist and a sitter who wants to be made to look powerful or beautiful or important or, you know, insert adjective here. Um, and then alternatively, and this is another thing that you often encounter when you're sort of dealing in the territory that I'm often in, um, there's the idea that portrait, portraits are artworks that are created primarily for historical or sort of record keeping purposes um, so that individuals who were significant at particular periods of history can be documented and, and remembered in posterity. And I suppose that is seen as a factor which is sort of, um, people seem to think it kind of diminishes from the, the quality of, of the portrait or the uh, merits of the portrait as an artwork. Um, and for me, I don't know about you, I'd be really interested to sort of hear your kind of take on this, but in interpreting portrait collections, I've sort of found to be a way around that to be, to acknowledge those kind of elements of portraiture and actually sort of use them to, um, to subvert, <laughs> I suppose, and to dismantle some of those kind of misconceptions that uh, some people and some of our audiences may have about about portraiture and about national portrait galleries and, and what it is that we do. Do you, either of you want to comment on, on that sort of concept, this idea that you can actually take what is seen to be a, a downside and make it work to your advantage? You've opened up a lot of questions there. My goodness, that's, that's, quite, a, <laughs> that's quite a challenge. I think um, two, two or three strands of what you said really resonate with me. It's very interesting the way you, you, you describe um, the power of portraiture. So there is a sort of business element to the production of portraiture as there was back in the 19th century. Mm. Um, and also like artists who specialise in portraiture, like artists who specialise in many other different types of subject matter and genre, there are um, those who are not so accomplished and those who are outstanding. So there are, I think we have to recognize this, there, are, there is a great tradition mm. of great portraiture, in, uh, artistically speaking. Um, there's also a strong issue here. It's um, about the commemorative role and how you how portraits project into the future um, status. I suppose mm. that, that that's a key thing. Um, one of the ways in which we uh, cut through that is I suppose because of the um, incredible attraction and power, uh, the visceral power of, of engaging with somebody else's personality and face and appearance and, and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, perhaps with the choices they have made about how they want to be commemorated, which could be through a, a modest cut to visit, or it could be through a very grand painting or sculpture, or it could be in other media too. So there is, um, there is a, an issue there. The, the other thing that, um, the, the other reason I think in particular why um, portrait galleries are, and portrait collections are more exciting and engaging and important than ever is because of the digital age we're in. Mm. Um, we all take and make and are the subjects of portraits, or not everybody, mm. but many, many do because we have um, phones in our pockets that allow us to do that. Now, um, in my case, I have to say, I, I'm no great portrait maker at all through digital imagery. <laughs> but there is a, the reason I bring that up, because there's been, through that, there's been a huge democratization of creating of portraits, which um, I think actually sharpens our judgments about what is a, a, a good portrait and not such a good portrait, and also, um, makes us think hard about, um, and rightly so, about um, uh, who should be in a portrait gallery. Mm. Because just, just as you were describing earlier, um, I, I think, you know, the doors are open. It shouldn't, the portrait galleries should mirror all of society, if, if, if at all possible. Um, that's utterly different to uh, the late 19th century um, uh, sort of model that we've, we've grown away from. Mm. Did you want to comment so, on that, Paul? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to, um, <laughs> there's, there's a lot there. Um, I think, um, I mean, I know that um, at the New Zealand Portrait Gallery, we're very interested in trying to make our um, 
make our collection more um, representative of the nation um, in, in every kind of respect. And one of the things that's kind of remarkable is that uh, um, our gallery is very, uh, has a small collection. It's not a very old collection, but it's mm -hmm. still a collection that has um, exactly the same um, kinds of biases as you'd see in a um, collection 200 years old. Um, I think we have um, maybe one portrait um, by a woman um, in our mm. entire collection, um, things like this. Um, and um, we don't really collect as the thing um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, anymore. So it's, uh, we, I think we kind of work to um, open up different possibilities for um, what, what a portrait gallery can be through our um, kind of um, exhibition program of um, loan exhibitions, essentially. Um, all of our exhibitions basically are built around loans um, mm. almost entirely, yeah. Mm. And would you say that your institutions and, and you as curators, um, so as representatives of national portrait galleries and as curators of portrait collections, are you, um, can you tell us about some examples from, from your own work or from your institution where you think we are, works that you, work that you're doing that you think is subverting those sort of conceptions? Um, yeah, I, I know, Christopher, you had a couple of... Um, yeah, I've got one, one particular guys. example, which is, um, I'd, I'd really appreciate using in this context to, to help answer your, 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 your important question. It's the actual um, brain of the artist. That's the title. It's the glass. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a fantastic work. Uh, um, sculpture if we could look at that and if I could just take a moment to explain what this is and how it relates to the to the to the questions you've asked so this is um uh, a work um acquired in the last 10 years by uh, an artist called Angela Palmer who was born in Aberdeen in Scotland and um she works in different media and what you're looking at here is um a glass sculpture um which consists of a series of um, sheets of glass that have been very delicately engraved um, and lit from below. And extraordinarily, this is a representation of a scan of the mm -hmm. artist's own brain, okay. Um, and it's a very strange, rather haunting and most unusual form of self-portraiture. That's, that's why I think it's interesting here because we're so used to, um, if I may put it like this, reading people's faces in order to, uh, you know, engage with them. Um, but here we've got uh, a, a fundamental image about um, this person's, this artist's sort of specific characteristics. And it throws up lots of fascinating questions about identity and indeed whether this is a portrait as, as, mm. as we would normally um, describe it. Um, and when we, when we acquired this, it, um, we, we really didn't know what the impact would be. It's, very, it's sometimes quite hard to judge, you know, how, how visitors and audiences will react. And um, in Scotland, the, the, um, the response was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, it begged lots of questions. People were fascinated. They were, they were, there was a lot of discussions going on around it, as you might imagine, mm. which was very pleasing. But it also um, bridged different audiences. And perhaps this is obvious, but we hadn't anticipated it. Not only were lots of gallery visitors really interested, but it engaged the scientific community too, because of mm -hmm. its because of its nature um, and uh, it's it's um it's slightly hard to describe I want you all please to come and see it in in person because it's, <laughs> it's not it's one of those it's one of those objects that really is not well served by reproduction in fact having spoken a lot about how how things are reproduced but it's it's strangely tremulously beautiful actually um, but it, it takes the, the whole idea of portraiture and what portraiture is and the power of portraiture off in a, whole, a completely different direction from what um, most of our collection um, suggests to people. Mm. And I love the way, uh, well, for me, I mean, one of the things that really resonates with me about that work is its, its situation in Edinburgh, which was the sort of cradle of medical teaching for Absolutely. 18th and 19th century. So it's got this wonderful sort of uh, conversation, a wonderful conversation with, with its, its location uh, and with your beautiful 19th century building. And I remember that when I last visited the MPG in Edinburgh, being very envious of that wonderful sort of room that you have 
with uh, all of that, that fantastic collection of death masks, <laughs> which <laughs> I was right. very covetous of, I must say. <laughs> well, you're looking there at the, thank you for bringing up that slide, because that's the, that's the gallery. It's a, it's a, a sort of palace of art is probably the way to describe it, very much mm. in late 19th century taste. And you can see um, the Great Hall of the gallery. Um, I hope that's, that, that everyone can see that. Now, the, mm. the brain of the artist we were just looking at, when we first displayed it, we put it right in the middle of that hall. Mm. And it was sensational having the, the, the contrast between this very impressive but very uh, traditional setting and um, a, a radical and thought-provoking um, portrait, in self-portrait in this case, mm. in the middle of it. Um, I, may I just pick on some, up on something you said, you, you mentioned about conversations and resonance. Um, and it's, it's absolutely, I think, key at the moment that um, it, it seems to us that portraits are powerful when they get people talking. They get, they, they, mm. it's that engagement and that challenge um, that mm. uh, really is a, is, a, is a measure, I suppose, of, of, um, of, of, the, of, of whether we're doing our work well or not. <laughs> In fact, mm. actually, as, as, mm. as, as curators, really. Mm. Mm. And there was another one of your slides, I think, Christopher, that you sort of have discussed in that context, the, the portrait of the three oncologists by Ken yes. Curry. Yeah, could, could we just very briefly show this? Is, yeah, um, that's a wonderful a, a, painting. It is an amazing painting. It's a large oil painting, this. Um, and um, it shows, uh, just as you say, three oncologists, three very distinguished um, experts who are engaged with the, the fight against cancer. It's actually, they, when this was painted some few years back now, um, they were all working in Dundee, um, a very uh, distinguished centre for, for research. And um, it, it is an extraordinary painting. Um, it's a very powerful, very, I, I have to say, very disturbing painting. I mean, it disturbs me every time I see it. Um, but what one once you know a little more about how and why it was created, mm. um, it has proved to be very, very um, uh, inspiring. In fact, for many people who've come to see it. So the, the three the three men who you see here, they've just been engaged with a procedure, and they are literally rapidly moving away from it because they want to go and share everything they've learned with other colleagues uh, across the UK and around the world. They are. Mm. Um, engaged in the highest levels of research in this incredibly important fight against uh, against this, this devastating disease. And um, it's a painting that's become, again, I'm overused term, but it's become a bit of an icon for our collection because so many mm. people remember it, um, the it's sort of ghostly figures and emerging from a, a dark background. But we've also had so many people who've wanted to come and see it because they, they and their lives have been touched by this, mm. this and terrible disease and actually they I know because I've spoken to a number of people there's a different type of power here we're talking about but mm. for, for a number of people that has personally proved very um, powerful for them and um, I suppose reassuring that's a very simple description but it means that it's, it's great to be reassured that such brilliant people such great mm. brains are engaged in this very important fight mm. so that's a very different type of uh, power from portraiture um, uh, to the sort we've been uh, we've been looking at earlier on, very personal, very very modern as well. I think actually. Yeah, okay. and I've just got an alarming message on my screen saying that we've only got about ten minutes to go, and <laughs> I know Paul, you um, you've also been working on yet another really interesting exhibition, which I I wish I would have <laughs> could have got to Wellington to see, and that was an exhibition based on uh, works from the collection of the Alexander Turnbull Library in Wellington, and it was an exhibition sort of looking at the relevance, the contemporary relevance of historical portraiture, and I know in the slides that you sent through there were some fantastic images mm. Um, to discuss, and I'm particularly intrigued by uh, all of those variations on the Chupaya drawing of Joseph Banks with the lobster. Could you tell us a little yes. bit about those and in the context um, of that exhibition? Absolutely. Um, so maybe we can get the original drawing up. Yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so this drawing is um, in the British Library. Um, it's not here in New Zealand for us to put on show, um, but it's um, an image by this guy, Tupaya, um, who served as the, he was from um, the place we now call Tahiti. Um, and he was the navigator for James Cook um, on one of his trips down into the Pacific. Um, and this is a, a drawing he did. Um, 
And it's a drawing. We think that the European man is Joseph Banks, and we don't really have an idea of who this Māori man is. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a really interesting example of a very early um, kind of portrait almost in the um, in the kind of Western tradition of portraiture um, uh, of these two individuals, um, even if we can't identify who they are. Um, and it's an item that's proved um, very, very resonant for contemporary artists in New Zealand. Um, it's one of the sort of earliest surviving depictions of a Maori person. Um, and it's sort of significant because it's drawn by a, another person who is Pacific, not, mm. not a European. It's not one of these kind of ethnographic depictions. Mm. Um, and so, Which so um, many of the images from Cook's voyages were. Exactly. I mean, we yeah. can, um, if we can bring up the first two, the Man of Easter Island and Man of New Zealand, um, that's a, those are perfect examples um, of those. Um, yeah. You know, um, these people called Man of Easter Island, Man of New Zealand. Um, this is just kind of, they, they stand mm. for a type. Um, and man, for, man of New Zealand, for example, um, we know exactly where he, where he was from. We know what his name was. Um, and I can't remember either of those details off the top of my head. But um, he, this is a depiction of a real person, um, a specific real person, but he's called Man of New Zealand. Um, Anyway, um, so this picture by Tupaya um, has been really resonant for New Zealand artists. And I feel like there's a, a you know, a potential exhibition just of these. Um, yeah. That would be really interesting to see. Um, so there's exactly this. Um, this is by a um, painter called Aisha Green. And this is a huge work. Um, this is this, um, this tiny little drawing blown up to be, mm -hmm. um, I think, two meters tall and three meters wide. Wow. Um, and Aisha's like characteristic style is to like flatten um, the thing she depicts. And um, you kind of lose that in this one because the original she's working from is um, flattened itself. Um, but um, Aisha, I think, Aisha is a Maori artist herself. And I think she's really interested in thinking about colonial encounters and um, representing them um, in her practice. Um, anyway, so the other, um, if we can show the embroidery now, um, Oh, wow. This is the one we actually um, showed at our in our gallery, mm -hmm. um, and um, Sarah Munro actually like replicates this image serially. She's done about thirty of these um, embroideries, um, and they all are centered on these two figures. And she um, kind of changes the objects that they're exchanging um, to kind of comment on um, New Zealand's kind of ecosystem um, largely. Mm -hmm the effects of the colonial encounter on our wildlife. So you see here the Māori figure has um, birds and the European figure has cats and possums and um, mm. weasels um, that are <laughs> kind of a threat to these um, animals, uh, to these birds. Um, anyway, so like what we were interested in doing in this exhibition, this um, work by Sarah Munro is part of it. We're interested in thinking about how historical portraiture can be a source for people to, uh, for artists to react to and reinterpret the past and make sense of it in um, different mm. ways. Um, yeah. Yeah. If we've got time, can we just quickly have one while we're on the, the subject of Joseph Banks? <laughs> <laughs> can we have a look? Um, firstly, a very, very different representation of Banks. It's a mezzo tint after a painting by Benjamin West. So it's Bank with his. He's got a bark cloth cloak and all of his booty that he collected on the Endeavour voyage. <laughs> yes, there we are. So this is a, a, a mezzo tint from our collection. Uh, the original painting is in the Usher Gallery in Lincoln, Lincolnshire in the UK. Um, Banks, of course, he was painted famously painted twice for um, the 1773 uh, Royal Academy exhibition, the very famous painting by Sir Joshua Reynolds, which is at NPG London, and a painting by Benjamin West, of, of which this is a print. So it's uh, this, you know, um, I don't like using the word iconic, but it is kind of an iconic representation of Banks and very much speaks to that sort of... Um, you know, devil may care kind of looting attitude <laughs> that he took towards his um, his uh, voyage on the Endeavour. For him, it was, you know, it was very much an adventure. He sort of dressed it up as science, but 
you know, it was also a, you know, he famously said, of course, that he wasn't going to do the grand tour of Europe because every blockhead does that. His grand tour was going to be a tour around the whole world. Um, but this is, uh, I think, a really sort of fantastic example of, of what you were talking about, Paul, about how even, a, you know, on the face of it, something which is historical and problematic can actually be um, utilised and subverted in really creative ways by contemporary artists. And if we go to the next slide along, Robert, we'll see this mm. image um, by uh, an Indigenous Australian artist named Daniel Boyd. Uh, he's from the Queensland area. Um, and it's part of a series. So there's uh, this kind of um, subversion of West's painting of banks. There's uh, a, a similar one, which is at the National Gallery, actually, which is um, where he's kind of subverting James Weber's portrait of, Kate, of James Cook, uh, John Weber's portrait of James Cook, which is in our collection. And there's also a painting of King George III. I think he's done a, a take on Nathaniel Dance's painting of George III. But on the face of it, this is, you know, this is a parody but it's also an incredibly rich and powerful and incisive uh, kind of critique of the behaviour that Joseph Banks was engaged in. And you'll see um, just sort of at, at near his foot there, his left foot, there's a, it's actually a self-portrait by the artist. And that's actually, it's referencing uh, uh, Joseph Banks souveniring the head of um, a Darug warrior uh, named Pemelwe and, you know, souveniring that and sending it back to England to, you know, be housed in a, in a collection somewhere. So it's actually, like I say, a, a very sort of powerful uh, uh, critique of, of, you know, these colonial, these tre tremendously awful colonial practices, but how contemporary artists can manage to at least, you know, reclaim some of that imagery and sort of uh, twist it to their own ends and, and subvert um, what would otherwise have been a, a very sort of powerful <laughs> representation of a, of a powerful white figure. Does this mean we've, we're out of time? I'm sorry. <laughs> there was actually one question for you, Paul, which I think we'll answer quest uh, very quickly. Um, a question from Jennifer who wants to know um, if you could explain what you meant when you said that the Portrait Gallery of New Zealand doesn't collect. Is that a uh, budget factor or...? Um, is it so it's twofold um on the one hand it's a budget thing we don't really we're um we operate on, entirely on a do, on a um donations basis mm -hmm. um so we don't have a huge budget um and the other thing is that we also don't have much space um mm -hmm. our collection store is pretty much full um if we get anything new we'll have to get rid of something we have oh. um <laughs> Sounds like so, my wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm afraid I've waffled on too long and we have gone over time. Um, but before I hand back to Jill, I just wanted to thank you both. Um, maybe we should have a round two. There's obviously um, a, lot of, a lot of fruit <laughs> in this discussion. So it's been really lovely to speak to you this evening and this morning, in your case, Christopher, and thanks so much for agreeing to be part of 15 Minutes of Frame. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher, Paul and Joe. Um, I could have listened to that all night, honestly. When Joe said uh, perhaps we should do a part two, I think he took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> it might be a part three and a part four. The can of worms has <laughs> turned into a cavern. But, yes, thank you so much for such a really interesting discussion um, about power and portraiture. Thank you, everybody who joined in here on Zoom and also live on Facebook. Um, we run these uh, 15 minutes of frame quite frequently and we have another one coming up shortly. So please jump on our website, portrait.gov.au, to get all the latest information. It's always great if you sign up for our emails or follow us on socials at portrait.au. That way you won't miss out on anything that's coming down the pipeline. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us from all over the world and we look forward to seeing you again soon.